Today we are honored to welcome a dedicated prosthetist. After she graduated from Pandit Dindayal Upadhyay College, New Delhi, she currently serves as a prosthetist as a at a leading uh, MNCs. She has presented numerous papers at conferences and highly active in knowledge sharing events. Despite being a newcomer, she has quickly gained the respect and admiration not only from her colleagues but from patient as well for her skills dedication innovative approach a fresh approach to the prosthetic space today we welcome dr shruti vadva thank you peter thank yeah. you for having me and for this gorgeous introduction yeah, i was a little nervous because uh, as you know this is our first video ever podcast for prosthetic org so you are my first guest happy to be <laughs> Okay so I lead the conversation like what I'm expecting from this conversation now so it's a very casual conversation and um, if you have any questions for me you can obviously ask it not a problem in that um I want to know your experiences and um how this prosthetic space specifically in the upper limb uh, landscape how it is evolving and somewhere along those lines we'll talk about uh, how those devices are different and um, what is the patient care and all those aspects but before we do that so when we talk about yourself first let me know how you came into this industry or the field and um, then we'll talk about how has been your journey to till here yeah sure so uh, like many i was preparing for my neat hug right and uh, in a moment of hope i gave those other entrance exam right right but i never checked the result uh one day i was sitting in class and i received a call from my college informing me that i had been selected right and uh, i had no idea okay so you know who they are what they are even talking about because i had deleted that thing from my mind so i of course uh, asked them like who they even are so then they explained everything to me and um, i got to uh, know that yeah i have given those then i went home i shared the news with my family and uh, they suggested that i could continue to prepare for my neat hug while pursuing this as an backup option so this field was your backup at that time yeah 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 actually uh, actually that was yes. yeah, that was so next day uh, we went for the counseling and there uh, they presented me with two options p and o and yep. ot yep. and i didn't know the you know a thing about those things okay i was i was new to those terms i haven't heard those so i found the wisest person among everybody who was sitting there uh that person was mr rabat he he was one of our professors and a pnd himself oh uh, then being a pno he might have suggested you go in this one only right exactly <laughs> i didn't know that he was a pno um uh, so i see guidance like what to choose and then he started explaining that uh, how the field is a blend of engineering and medicine yeah. and i get to do the patients uh, plus uh, i had a pcmb background so that could be a plus point for me so taking his advice um, i opted for pu No that is how I got that vision into like okay. industry and how was the journey after that like what made you stay because as you said this was your backup option right so what made you stay there actually yeah so um, after joining the program um, I started liking it um, it felt unique uh, despite the negative comments i was hearing from my seniors my peer people claiming that the field is not good there is no growth apart in our scope of in the future right yes yes yeah. so i think uh, everybody has a hard yeah like kind of similar incident happened with me um 
but yeah before i start you finish your part yeah no, i totally agree because uh, to whomever i have met right um and i question uh, the same thing to them they answered me similarly like uh, they got here as a second option you know it was their second option yeah. or a backup plan like me so i can say that many people can relate with my story um but um i was uh, like for me i know initially it was a backup option but after a month of joining when i was enjoying it um i discussed it with my family and um, my mom uh, said that if uh, you enjoy something i right? this is something she really believes that if you enjoy something if you put your 100% into something you can get the result right so i was uh, really sure of it that i am enjoying it and if i put my 100% i would get the result so this is how i dropped the idea of <laughs> becoming an mbbs doctor okay and uh, choose to stay here oh um, but my story uh, contrary to your this was my first option like this was my passion to be follow uh I was in my like uh, 11 12 I was just completing that or maybe I was doing uh, the final exams for this and uh, in those time I used to watch a lot of TV so mostly discovery national geographic channel and in discovery there was a part where uh, a professional a piano professional he was fitting a patient with a um, robotic hand or like from the shoulder part my shoulder was not there in that okay. video and i saw that and that clicked and i was like i want to do this because this is very interesting and unique and i like it i was like very much into electronics and circuitry and i i loved everything about robotics so i said see robotics i like it i want to become a doctor uh, as from my background so i was like this is a field i want to go in and have a look how it goes and after my 12th i completed that once the result came like for a year no one knew around me that this field existed even i didn't so after talking to multiple councils that maybe they know something about this they don't know so i came across here in bangalore mobility india and i got the admission and that day was like for me it was this is done for me i'm staying here i'm not going anywhere else So that was my part. I'm really happy because not many people, uh, uh, you know, chosen by themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, but I'm actually uh, observing the shift in the trend. Like you, my juniors, uh, knew about the industry, and it's no longer a second option. Yeah, it's slowly becoming on the verge of becoming a mainstream kind of a thing. Yeah, and I really like that. It's okay. You know, and I like that because when I started, um, like how relatives and other people used to ask, "Nah, like what you're doing for studies?" And I used to tell them, "I I'm doing this," and they don't even know about what I'm saying. So I have to explain them in the layman terms. Like, um, have you seen a person without hand? Um, yes. So we fit a new hand for him. I used to explain to them like that. I still have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I can relate. Like, not many people are aware of the industry. Even I wasn't. Yeah. You found it somehow. Yeah. Right. So I I can say that um, I think uh, we can increase the awareness. We can. Hopefully, this conversation leads us to a part of that. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah. yeah. This could be a thing. Maybe. Maybe she knows. Uh, uh, we'll find out. We'll find out in the future. Yeah. So you are currently working at a leading MNC, yeah. and and you are a prosthetist for upper limb devices specifically. Um, my question or my curiosity leads me to that. Um, what kind of uh, ratio or you say what kind of uh, comparison we can make between the people who wear a prosthesis and people who don't wear a prosthesis but they know about it, or even the people who are not even aware of that. Device or services that are available to them. Uh, your thoughts on that? So, uh, coming to the people who don't know about the services, 
uh, I think that would be a group who hasn't um, met with such things with themselves or somebody in their family. Like you're saying in terms of amputation yeah. and surgeries, right? Yes. So if you say, so like in my family, I had nobody who has amputation, right? So I was not aware of the field. But if I'm imagining, if there would be somebody close to me who had this kind of uh, disability, I would have explored the option, right? At least have a general knowledge. Yeah. So I think um, that could be one thing that because nobody is around there who need those things. So people are not exploring that area, right? And even it's like... Um... And what I have observed in my practices and till now what I've seen, it's like um, when you compare all the medical or allied sciences, uh, specific industry wise, right? Uh, our industry is so niche that uh, people are hardly talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So that is one of the reasons that the common people who are, who have, doesn't have to do anything with the medical background or anything. They don't know even. Uh, even I've talked to some nurses, uh, like uh, last year, uh, one of my family member was admitted in a hospital due to some uh, condition. And um, I was just talking to the nurses, like you obviously do amputations. Uh, then after the amputation, what happens? So the nurses or the surgeons who are there, most of them, they don't know about uh, prosthetic devices. And their answer was somewhere along the lines of, uh, we stitch them up. Once the wound is healed, they can, uh, they leave the hospital and they do physiotherapy. And I was like, there is a number of options and services for them. Um, but yeah, there is a stigma, you say, or like um, a backstory to that. Yeah, of course. Um, like, as per my experience, coming to doctors, still they are aware. But of course, I cannot expect that from common common yeah. people or people from non-medical background right but hopefully uh, in future i think we'll need to uh, place where people are aware of the field as well right and uh, answering your next question um, how many people use uh, those devices so actually um, there could be uh, multiple factors to it okay. right so like uh, the like the medical factors are there no, right okay. and then there are psychosocial factors right to use a device or to you even to you know drive a car okay. let's see okay so when you talk about um, medical um, aspect of that and social ex a social aspect of that so how you differentiate on both of that Medical uh, aspect I'm talking about if let's say the person has a very severe or very high level of amputation, right? The result would be different from a person who has a lower level of amputation, let's say transradial. You cannot compare the result from a yeah. transradial to a shoulder result. Yeah, we can compare from transradial to a transradial, but yeah. not like the higher in user level. Of so that's the goal of the patient. Okay. Right. And if a prosthetic device or anything if, if that is serving the purpose then the person will use it right but if it's not helping them of course the person will discard correct and coming to psycho uh, psychological aspect of it then I have seen people um, who have lost hand from like below elbow or wrist is yeah. right and we can expect very good result in those cases. Okay. Right? But because of the depression, you know, that um, thought process that now I'm not able to do anything, they just don't give their 100%. Um, do you think with these kind of patients or in the social factors, uh, there is also plays a part of stigma around it, like the amputation, and um, using the external devices. For us, this is a device which will enable them to uh, reach their potential after an amputation. But for them, it could be a purely alien device that we are implementing on them. So how that plays? Actually, this is how a person looks into that. 
um i had a patient who was uh, an above elbow amputee and we were fitting the hand to that person right and we could sense that the patient is not you know motivated enough right like you know you can sense those vibe that okay that person wants to try everything they are giving their 200% into training they want to try any different things and from that person uh, i have to ask every time that please uh, perform this activity train yourself uh, do this for 10 times like that so in the moment i you know uh, uh, question like what's what's wrong like i can see that there is something wrong in the process like if there's anything wrong on our side if you are not happy with the process if it's, it's uncomfortable or something else is there that is bothering you then that person told me that i don't want this i'm just getting in because my parents are uh, forcing me to get oh. well, he was getting married oh so just for the appearances for that exactly yeah so um and he was like this is not me right i am like what i had this is not that no so i think um after uh, amputation um therapies are essential i know yeah. but counseling you know mental therapies are also essential yeah the sociological aspect of any patient post amputation is very true uh, and it should be there yeah. um in india specifically um there's not much uh, practice happening right now and uh, that leads to a poor outcome for the prosthetic devices and so if you go out and uh, if you see a patient without hand or leg right or yeah. twisted legs let's see you notice that everybody around them look uh, look at them very differently yeah. right they start observing them noticing them and it makes them feel weird and i believe that as a society uh, we are not accepting those things as well i uh, so there are two things one that patient need to accept the things that these things has been happened now what can i do to make it better for myself yeah. right and i have found both kind of patients one with depression who doesn't want these things one who had you know severe level of amputation by atrial patients okay. and he was highly active who was asking me to try different stuff okay. right i have i have came across like those patient as well yes so in these kind of people you can meet right and other side would be about the society how we look at yeah. people if we can uh, change the perspective right like of our and like of the society and the patient i think um, we can get much better result much better acceptance in terms of prosthetic device usage yeah and uh, yeah more better up out yeah because from the point of what you said right as a society what we can do i have noticed like um, in the india or like the asia continent uh these kind of things are like uh, still saw uh, the people around us see it as a thing which should not be shown but when we see in the western culture or the us and you know, they embrace it they showcase that okay we have a uh, prosthetic maybe a leg or a, ha- a hand but uh, they showcase it such a way that uh, it looks very pleasing to the eye they customize it for themselves like i have seen patients or like people in uh, social media they have prosthesis they got obviously fitted from a center but uh, once they get it home they customize it to their liking like for kids um, i saw, saw one kid um he was trans radial amputation if i remember correctly and he was a big fan of uh, tony stark iron man and uh, some of the uh, organization or agency they collaborated it and they made a specific for that person that chai uh, iron man kind of a full outer kit for his hand and after receiving it he was so happy that he used to showcase to everyone that see i have iron man so like those kind of perspective 
maybe that can bring a shift to these other places where we still see it as a stigma or like an alien object. Yeah, I would really like to add in that. Um, you are absolutely right in that. Even in India, um, when we launched the hand, it was without glove. Okay. But, but as per Indian demands, people want to hide it. Yeah. Right. So we um, have done so many patients here in India, abroad, right? And uh, if you compare um, both the sides uh, from people who want to get a glove, I think 80% would be Indian. Like yeah. outside, they do not want a glove. They, you, as you were saying, they want to embrace that thing. Yeah. They see, I have got this robotic thing. They find it cool. Yeah, they find it cool. There are specific fashion shows just particularly for the cross the day. I think yeah. Ninja. Mm. Ninja <laughs> so I think yeah, that is one factor. Like in India, I could say um, we are still uh, under uh, development uh, when it comes to these things. I would mean, say not development, but underexposed, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, that would be a much uh, good terms and if we have to say it in that sense. Yes, yeah. but uh, hopefully we'll get to that certain point where people do not want to hide it and just want to embrace it like other. Yeah. We do have, but the number is safe. Yeah, the number is very minor, I would say. Yes. In other words, um, yeah, when we are talking about all the patient and all, I want to know, like, um, what is your incident? Like, did you had any incident with a specific patient or a story which uh, stood out for you or like it was a very unique thing to observe? Unique thing? Um, like, my every patient um, has been unique. <laughs> no, of course, uh, every patient is unique and their needs are unique. That is not, I'm not saying in that sense. I'm saying like um, any incident that you found or you observed that this I never thought but maybe this is good like that yeah um, so um, I had this uh, patient right a bilateral amputee transradial one side shoulder disarticulation on another mm -hmm. and very short transradial right like how short we are talking only this much yeah okay what have we studied? Um, if you have a shorter length, the range of motion would be compromised. Yeah, right? and they will have more effort to get the same result. Yes. So because of the lifting power, he given leverage, uh, yeah. the range of motion won't be as much as uh, like for a patient who has a longer stump, right? But he being a bilateral amputee was relying entirely on his transradial. Okay. Right, was other side was shoulder disarticulation. Yeah. Right, and uh, he uh, requested that uh, he wants to eat by himself, right, and um, drink and you know do the activities so that he can be independent as much as possible. So, what, like, uh, you as you said, I am a newcomer, right? I have studied that range of motion would be less if you have a short transitional stop. Yeah. Right. And the person was asking me complete, completely a different thing, okay. a complete opposite, right? So uh, he want to overreaching that, yeah. 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 Right. So, uh, but I didn't want to say no. Okay. Right. Because I could feel that this is needed, right? So we experimented. We designed the socket in such a manner that with even a short stump, he was able to reach his mouth. And able okay. to eat and drink. And how did you achieve that? Uh, we uh, played with the, you know, length. Yeah. Because he was a bilateral amputee. Yeah. Right? So, we got that scope. Yeah, right? there is a scope to just manipulate the length. length yeah. So that he doesn't cross your mouth. Yeah. Right? So, we played with the length. Also with the socket design, uh, you know. Tightening it at places uh, where it won't restrict it, keeping the terminals a bit low, right? So that he can uh, move his elbow, right? So, a couple of other things we tried. And finally, we came up with the prosthesis, uh, which was functionally um, providing him with full range of motion, 
and also looking good cosmetically this was something i hadn't thought um also um this is um, a very recent thing right again a transgender mpt and uh, he's a bodybuilder okay so like this kind of job requires you know weight gain weight yeah. loss right and it can impact your socket fit yes i like the frequency of uh, socket gain yeah uh, so like if you are frequently you know losing or gaining weight you have to frequently change your socket yeah right so what uh, we came up with that will fit a revoke it to that patient so that we can decrease the frequency of uh, socket change okay. so do you know what a revoke fit kit is i know it's something around the lines of a, a pneumatic kind of a suspension kind of a thing no 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 no, no. i'm wrong uh, that um, oh, one second that is a uh, spring system or a rope system which you can tighten use it uh it has a two part of socket right in that one yeah thank okay. so uh that thing allow you to tight or loose your socket okay. right make it making it adjustable hmm. so we were focusing on at least it will decrease the frequency right yeah so uh i said that i'll do that uh i had no more idea about the kit how to use it how to fit it and even i don't know how to fabricate it right for the first time it is very difficult to fabricate yeah being new to that uh, i did my research then yeah. i did my homework and i even uh, reached out to people who had prior experience in fitting that okay. right and one thing that was common is um, nobody has any idea about upper limb yeah because usually this kit is used in lower limbs uh that to like uh, maybe tf or um, yeah yeah and uh, they do use it for upper limb also but mainly for above elbow well wow. uh, sometimes for below elbow as well i i even reached out to the manufacturers okay <laughs> like they can help me out with something yeah. so they had no like material to share you know with me this they, they, they have like manufacturers now so for them product specification and how it need to be packed and shipped that is the main concern all the fitting it is learning difficult they do and as even a manufacturer we are the one right but um, we can also help them guide them actually i know the major part is technical yeah. right we uh, teach them the technical things but sometimes we can also help with the fabrication and as per their part i was aware that they help you with fabrication as well oh. right but upper limb um, i there was uh, uh, not much of a time right and there was like uh, this is what uh, all we have got yeah <laughs> like this is useful <laughs> not yeah. all any pages their document was only to yeah <laughs> okay yeah. yeah so um when i think but to the people who i have reached out um they shared their knowledge about lower limb um and it was really helpful right um it came very handy when i was fabricating the thing out right and i i remember uh, somebody uh, mentioning that it could be a bit tricky uh, like uh, not impossible but tricky. yeah tricky yeah you know. and i answered i like tricky things <laughs> then how tricky is was when you were fabricating uh it was uh i won't say but tk like um because i had studied and um, i got the experience of multiple people yeah okay. right and i have got gathered all the information i need so we were able to uh, fabricate that socket with adjustable electrode panel okay so the idea behind that was and that see is from um, patient uh, say has uh, lose uh, lost 10 pounds mm-hmm. right he may uh, lose the electrode contact correct yes right and then the hand will not function yeah and if they have gained weight in that it will be tight it will be pressing the muscle yes, it would be like uh, painful for the patient yeah. as well yeah so idea was that only that um, it should maintain a constant con- like co- contact throughout his journey of okay. weight gain weight loss right 
so we de- designed the socket in such a manner that the elastode panels become adjustable and he was able to tighten it loose it so if i can understand it correctly the panels what you have separated and fitted with revocate right those were the placement for the electrodes yes so suppose if my uh, socket is here so the electrode is somewhere here so you have cut it a panel for this part and then fitted a revocate above that so that this could be adjustable yeah so we uh, placed the panel uh, on the electrode side okay right so whenever he loses it tight it so the panel will open up or close so, over the electrode right so nice approach yeah yeah even i learned that today <laughs> because i i thought only for, like in the starting right i confused it with some other thing now i remembered i usually work that with lower limbs and just for like um, maybe volume changes yes just for that um and there's there's not much use of electrode as of now yeah not much but there are but not much of the use so yeah that's a cool idea yeah so i'm basically working uh, for binding hand so i play with electrodes every time like it's in my hand yeah uh, for me it's different it's a different story because i understand that i'm into a very niche area Uh, and not many people are aware of it mm-hmm. so it's fine i don't even be in them right but the, i was really happy that we were able to do it and patient was really happy the result uh, were good so that so he's still continuing to do his gym work yeah yeah so now he's uh, preparing for some competition in india or like outside of india in india i guess yeah in india. so he told me that he gained 20 kg oh so let's see uh, how that socket is yeah. so <laughs> how long can you <laughs> this day, right when hopefully at least uh, until like 6 months hmm. i don't want to be <laughs> okay. for a socket change yeah. at least yeah that's it nice. so when you work with all these patients and everything i'm sure you work with a uh, couple of people like a multidisciplinary team right how that equation fits into your workflow uh i really believe having a multidisciplinary team at your space can a result into better things like okay. was if you have a physiotherapist in you know sitting along with you and you are you know assessing a patient you see that okay this a uh, range of motion restrictions stiffness or contracture you can just forward it to them and i think having uh, an occupational therapist could be a major benefit like especially in terms of training right okay because training a person with banning hand or a prosthesis mm. right sometimes it's easy other times it's not and i remember yeah. uh, that bilateral above elbow patient yeah training was the major thing for me like fitting that patient was not that much of a hassle right but when it uh, came to training i actually you know uh, took hand and i was trying to do, do stuff that he was asking me for and like how can i do it without using my other who that who want to be independent they are usually like uh, i'm i'm not going to use the hand i'll use only the prosthetic hand so now you teach me how to do it yeah uh, uh, yeah but uh, to those people uh, i always tell them that prosthetic hand is a supportive one okay. you still have a natural hand and uh, you should start working with that mm. this is my advice to the patient because i may, my goal is not to make the person use the prosthesis most of the time the goal is that the person should do the things they want to do okay and heal this time right so of course if you are a unilateral amputee my advice would be start using your other hand and also get a prosthetic hand for supportive activity needs to decrease the frequency correct of uh, the fatigue you are yeah fatigue fatigue is the major factor yeah. right for um, every amputee what i have seen um unilateral bilateral if you see the fatigue ratio unilateral is still little less 
then buy better one but uh, here is the consumption for them it is like for us normally if we are sitting or doing any act taking up this bottle i was like it is easier for me but for a low water patient that is a task for him or her well so as we were talking about this task like how we dealt with the bottle for unilateral it is very difficult right so for bilateral also it won't be like a major task for you uh, how do you train for those people yeah see picking a bottle is not uh, a difficult task anymore right uh, you can easily pick it up with a prosthetic hand unilateral or bilateral but yeah uh, people can come up with uh, different or unique uh, requirements such as uh such as uh, uh like that bilateral uh, person uh, was asking me to uh, make him independent in terms of uh, utilizing the washroom and toiletries right so i i was uh, I will to help him with the prosthetic hand of course also uh, it's not about prosthetic hand it was more about rehabilitation yeah. right um, again goal is not ki yeah you have to use the prosthesis for everything Correct. right you can incorporate um, special aids right so i told him that these are some special aids that we can install in your washroom so that you can you know unzip yourself and you know wear the pants again and everything so like i read a lot of articles <laughs> i know a lot of person in that sense i'm yeah yeah so cool i think uh, for me the limitation is because not many people are skilled in that well i cannot go every time to somebody and ask right and not um, everything is on the internet again yeah no there are but the information is so scattered and uh, not organized it is very difficult to understand a topic if you are just purely based on internet searches especially if you talk about upper limb it's very limited like limited people doing it limited people have the knowledge case studies are very less yeah uh, research papers are like there are but while you are searching something like you are looking for a specific topic not for the whole uh, jargon or like the whole idea of it So f- to find that specific topic, it is very difficult in Upper Limb. Yes, and this is the thing I face a lot because for me, um, I can of course I have some people who to whom I can reach out, but uh, I would uh, rather choose to explore the things by myself. So yeah, while we talked about uh, the actions and the importance of OT uh, about the bionic hand, can you tell us the difference between what's a bionic hand and what's a myelectric? Uh, sorry, what's a bionic or myelectric hand and what's a body powered hand? Yeah. So basically, uh, you can categorize your functional upper limb prosthetics into three categories. Okay. first is body power then you have your externally power and the third is hybrid right so body power as the name suggests that the power is coming from patient's own body and so there would be a cable attached and the patient has to move their shoulder to pull the cable which in turn operates the device that could be a hand or an elbow right and if a prosthesis has all these cable based components then you can call it a body power prosthesis coming to externally power again from the name we can understand that in this case the power is coming from external source that could be your batteries most of the time right and like myoelectric and bionic prosthesis uh, uses battery as a power source Hybrid would be a prosthesis where you are combining both the components, one body power and other um, external. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Like um, most of the 
shoulder cases shoulder amputation either one component is like the terminal device or the hand is body powered as a uh, battery powered and the elbow and the movement of the elbow joint for the prosthesis is body powered the stat count as a hybrid one uh actually in shoulder disarticulation prosthesis it's very difficult to fit a body powered component because you don't have the shoulder so how would you harness the you know power or how would you provide the excursion to the cable okay right so i have seen one patient who was using a body power prosthesis i don't know how they you know um put the harness into place but he was able to use it right but most of the time it's very difficult because the patient doesn't have any shoulder no. right even in short ee if uh, shoulder motion is restricted like i had this patient with the uh, stiffness in the shoulder muscles because he was not using his uh, uh, limb after the amputation so it uh, you know it developed stiffness uh, some muscle um, uh, contracture was there right so uh, in that case uh, he was not even able to lift this much and if we the person cannot move their shoulder it's very difficult to uh, operate yes to operate the cable in that space so for higher level of amputation mechanical options uh, could be limited right but yes uh, one option uh, that we use often is uh, banding hand with mechanical elbow right because that combination makes the prosthesis lightweight compared to a prosthesis where all the external where you have all the external powered components right okay. also cost effective for the patient and by that you can use the elbow and the hand together right because you don't have to switch yeah there's not one um, input right so this is a combination we use us often right but otherwise you can you know it dep- totally depend on the patient uh, conditions and what are the goals and you can prescribe either with body power external power or hybrid okay you talk about prescription right before we jump into prescription i wanted to know like how this hand what we have in front of us how this is different than any other hand in the market yeah and also like introduce that hand up us so that i would love to so uh this is the hand we call zeus okay right and this is the strongest hand in the world right by strongest i am talking about the grip strength okay and so what's I'd... like the highest to grip it can yes yeah, so 152 newton right the if we convert it into like layman terms 150 newton how how we will measure that so it's just the power uh, like grip force you can see so how strongly uh, i'll hold something yes yeah. so just i know like the audience cannot feel this but you can so maybe you can become a test subject yes. okay so then just uh, i should say hand whatever you want okay right okay so you can yeah. you can feel the strength i can feel the strength especially in the like pinky side Pinky finger side. Yeah. yeah. So this is how strong it is, right? And it's very durable. Like impact resistance is there. So like even if, if the patient is going somewhere, he may hit something like a table, bed, any corner. Okay. So there are less chances of breakage. Okay. Right. I I I do not have any surface like solid surface yeah. glass and the cushion. No. But way. yes, like you can feel how strong it is. And one thing that I really like about is uh, about this banding hand is local serviceability. You know what I mean? So, like, when you talk about the banding hand or prosthesis in general, if you're talking about high advanced components, what is um, the major drawback is because the developed ones are coming from out of India. Correct. Yes. They like they are the more advanced one. Yeah. So basically. the manufacturing units are in europe us right you can get the hand here or any other component but for servicing if something goes wrong yeah right because all things are electrical components correct right if that happens you have to send the hand back to europe yeah and then they will repair it and then they will send it back yes 
So in that case, is the person who whose hand is went for service, he is without prosthetic device for at least uh, two three months. I'm guessing. Exactly. And imagine like, uh, you have uh, let's say one year of warranty, right? And three months you do not uh, have the hand. No. Like you can imagine how would a patient feel. And even it's not about warranty, but what a patient would do without the hand for three months, right? And especially if a patient is bilateral, right? That person is entirely dependent on their hands, right? right. So in that scenario, is to you know save the money, to save the efforts, to save the time, because time is a very major thing, uh, and you know to prevent this um, thing that okay the patient should not suffer. Doing this repair and repair, uh, maintenance thing, we developed the hand in such a manner that it can be easily repairable, and the patient um, do not have to worry that okay, what if I break the hand? So this is manufactured here in India? No, in okay. Poly. Okay. Uh-huh. And uh, how the service is like uh, for repairability and everything? It is in India. Yeah. Oh. So you just have to send the hand to us, and we'll take care of it. So this is something I really admire about the hand. That's really nice because um, first we we'll give them the uh, we give patient the hand, then we train them. Then if something goes wrong, for the uh, hands or the bionic one which is available in the market, something goes wrong, they have to send back the hand to the manufacturer, and it will take a lot of time. But here it is here. You know, it's more of a psychological burden that what if something happens? What if something goes wrong? Right. So if you are saying like, this is what we do. We tell our patient that use it as you want. Yeah. Right. Even if it breaks, you don't have to worry. Yeah, we are there to repair it. Yeah. So like, it gives a different kind of confidence to the patient that okay, I can do anything. I do not have to worry. Right. And this expands the horizon for that. That right? Okay. I, no. Yeah. I, why would I'm worrying? Why would I think that what if something goes wrong? I'll just use it. I'll if something goes wrong, I'll send it to them. Then repair it and get it back to me. So this is the kind of confidence we want our patient to have. That explore things, get into new new uh, hobbies, new opportunities, and. You know, utilize it as much as you want without worrying about anything. Uh, so some, some, and like you know, asymmetrical positions of finger was there, right? So he requested us that uh, he need a grip because it was a living for him, right? So we customized the grip for him, and he was able to hold the camera, and now he shoots and do everything that he wants. Yes. Yeah. And similarly, we have customized grips for other patients as well for driving. For typing and some other work, so I think it also you know enables a patient uh, to explore some other areas. Because if a patient is, uh, patient is young, right, then um, uh, they may be into some specific activity. But after some time, they may want to try something else, right? Okay, I understand with like you know old people, this could or could not be the case, right? Yeah, of course. Because their lifestyle is kind of fixed, but to somebody young, you know, I cannot say that this is all the grips you have, and you can do whatever you can do with these. I and if the patient has this additional option, I mean, so they won't be afraid. Yeah, what if um, like my friends are going to kayaki, right? Yeah. And I want to do that, but I don't think so. I'll be able to hold a hold like hold that uh, stick or that, you know. Yeah. Then so. And those situation, you can just reach out to us, and we'll try to you know customize some grip that can help you to achieve that activity. Um, okay, I, I have two like uh, points that I need you to discuss with me. Uh, first, you said about uh, water, like the rowing part in kayaking. There is always a water room. So, is this hand is like waterproof or water resistant or water repellent? Like what does this hand have? So, like there are of course two terms: water resistance and water proof. Uh, till now, it's not, right? It's water resistance. 
and um, um so if a drop of you know few drops of water won't do any harm like a light rain it won't be much harm uh see i, I still advise my patient if it's possible to you know cover it up it was just uh you know a safety yeah. right but you do not have to worry like what if you know water is there and you're it's drinking spill, it yeah. that it spills and you know so in that scenario you don't have to worry you just have to switch it off keep it aside for some time and can reuse it Right, like because it, it is water resistant, but not waterproof. So of course you cannot submerge it into water. But yeah, you do not even have to worry when you are around the water. You can be just careful and do do your work. Okay. And the second part is like uh, you said, if a patient want to customize his or her grip, they can reach out to you. But if, suppose the patient is like too far away from your center, then um, how that can be achieved? Yeah. They have to come back travel to you. earlier it was the case okay right so before our digital ecosystem our adp platforms ether okay. digital platform uh if the patient need any kind of software modification they need to come to our clinic right yeah. or to any uh, clinician they have to visit there right Correct. so that they can do the modification but after um, we realized the gap that the there is this gap between the patient and the clinician something is something was broken in the system we realized it and we built this platform okay that allows the clinician to do any kind of software modification from any part of the world any time so the patient and the clinician doesn't have to sit like we are like sitting yeah, right we are sitting right now uh, they just have to do a video call kind of thing okay. right so we do have that option so they can connect on the app right and the you know clinician can do the modification and patient will receive it and they are good to go oh so like that is very easy for of course as a professional it is easy but from the patient point of view i can see that they don't have to travel much yeah. travel also see coming to coming or traveling to a place this of course they have to put up efforts right? correct if you are a working professional yes hey, the have, timing right, and the financial to. burden yeah. and everything i i get that point yeah time money efforts everything you have to invest to get 2 minute or 3 minute thing done yeah. i'd say if it's a minor modification correct right. but for that 2 or 3 minute thing you have to take that kind of burden yeah and right? but with this arm it's eliminated it's no longer in the system right and i guess with the application of the app it is also easier as a professional also just to track the patient progress and uh, what do you say have a record or a history of it yes like what has been done what can be done what needs to be changed and what has changed in the past that all record is very easy to maintain like earlier we used to like for any modification what we do for a device either it's a palm or lower limb you have to manually write it down right but i think with the implementation of apps it is much more easier yes so with any kind of app it's very easy to store the data and this app is also has also this kind of feature where that data gets stored okay. right if the patient allows right and uh, it helps the clinician to make data driven decisions right um so let's say you you have a patient who is very new to this system right and you can keep the track like what they are doing what grip they are using at what time they are using and those metrics help you to uh, do the follow up sessions right if you observe something unusual or something that you think that okay this may be cons- uh, you know concerning that in that case you can reach out to your patient you can have a call and discuss those things out and it's very easy for the patient also that they do not have to come again like they can reach out to their clinician any time yeah. for clinician uh you know i do not worry when uh you know consulting an international patient right because i have this kind of flexibility so uh, you know to clinician we are providing this kind of flexibility that you do not have to worry yeah what if uh, they ask me something and then you know because we have this kind of fear right ki yeah um, and also like um, i guess the assessment part or like the process of whole prescription data driven thing 
it is much more uh, valuable to the patient also because you can show that uh, this was like for some patient they need proof of concept that this works or like if we are doing this it will result to this so they need some kind of a proof so i think that also builds up with the app applications right so like our smartwatch we can see our progress correct right? and if let's say i have set the goal of 10000 steps i if i if i notice that okay i had uh, you know done seven 7000 i'll be more motivated to complete those 10000 steps i won't be like okay three more steps are three thousand yeah. steps are there right so these kind of things even the patient can see they can see their progress yeah so they can be more motivated right it helps them this i know is just a psychological thing but i have seen like uh, the same concept uh, is used in gamification so gamification is just like um let's take an example of temper run a very common game uh, there is no concept of game in that it's just a person who is running and while running he will get some points coin yeah uh, i have and yeah that. and that is general the gamification of any application like you do something and you get a reward may not be you can use it physically or anything but it just a proof that you did the smile yes yeah, so you have achieved something yeah, yeah. right so i think uh, this platform has uh, provided a lot of flexibility to the user to the clinician uh, by providing remote configuration data driven decision traceability is there you can set the goals so a lot of features are there right and everything combined can result in better outcomes right and that was the goal that's why yeah, yeah so i think it has played a major role yeah so when we talk about all this devices goals and um, data driven uh, prescriptions how do we define a prescription first in general like what is a general prescription for an upper limb and then specifically to your process or your findings what you did as a prosthetist at your place prescription is the foundation to achieve optimal outcomes okay. right if the prescription is incorrect you, everything else may fail right and the key to prevent this is assessment and if you have carried out thorough assessment of the patient there are very less chances that you prescribe something of the you know need yeah need or like goal oriented yeah so i think if you are carrying out the assessment then you would be fine right and uh, assessment is um, a very lengthy process right um it start with the basic information and results into um a specific device okay. right yeah. in your assessment you have made up your mind yeah right? like we get to know about the basic stuff of the patient and the medical history of it and then we decide what the goals and everything is there yes yeah that that's that that is how i do it yeah. right so you but i'll point out some things that uh, people don't tend to put much value or much okay. thought but they hold a significant role in you know fabricating or formulating your prescription right so are uh, you told basic information yeah. so what kind of information you um, notice in my practice what we take is like mean age sex uh, mainly to just uh, record a uh, keep a patient record and um, a contact information or like say the general area where they are staying or uh, the house is there or from where they came yeah those are like the basic information maybe some patient uh, comes with uh, they specifically know what the disability is so they come with that yeah yeah of course we are right that we need those kind of information for documentation to contact the person right but i think these things can give you an overview right like uh, why do we ask for age right okay yeah like you can tell me that yeah. that is very easy age is like uh, there are certain devices or certain components in the devices which is restricted to this age and it also plays a role in the weight of the prosthesis 
or like the component so yeah age like uh, for a child uh, for a very young child uh, you can't give a prosthesis which weights like 1.5 kilo yeah yeah so that is the relative comparison what i can give yes so it's just not merely for documentation yeah. right if you are asking the patient about their age it plays a very significant role right similarly gender we ask gender yeah. right male like ask or we observe right male or female right nobody uh, you know pays attention to these minor details but if you notice a gender can significantly impact the cosmesis again it's very subjective yeah. some may not be even bothered with that those things but the point is uh, the female tend to have smaller hands yes. right and um, if a person is concerned about the cosmesis right then you have to take those things into consideration yeah. because you may offer something that comes in various sizes so that you can match with the closest okay. right so gender is one thing you note it but why hey uh address again yeah. right um like you have said ki pe- like people may know about the disability and they will reach out to you right but you have to also take uh in like you know that thing in notice where the person is coming from because that thing can impact the timeline of your treatment right yeah they, if you have a patient who lives like 10 minute walk from your clinic they can come and go any time they would like and there would be a lot of flexibility but if you are talking about a person who doesn't uh, live nearby or who is out from out of state or out of country in that case your yeah, treatment the timeline shifted yeah would be you know you have to uh, carefully consider those things right you have to create a schedule and you know if the patient is coming from 10 days you have to complete the entire process in 10 days yeah right so Uh, uh you know these things are very minor yeah but can give you overview again we are not finalizing anything because these things are also subjective right? and i guess when you talk about addresses uh, the, from the patient where he is uh, he or she is coming from that also indicates a certain demographic of it or like the landscape from where they are coming especially in lower limbs i would say yeah. like if a person is coming from rural areas yeah. right so you can imagine the kind of terrain and the you know, environment they would be having right if a person is coming from gurgaon or some urbanized you know the terrain and the walking pattern or let's like say uh, just the overall general area is much more different than a rural area yes and also in upper limb it plays a significant role your area you know i believe uh, influences the mindset yeah. right that is one thing also the kind of family uh, you know environment neighborhood you have if you have somebody who can help you with task right especially in upper limb right in that case uh, you know there would be less burden on the patient i am a person who always support independency I, that i want to make my person as independent as possible right but still if uh, there are some limitation and i know that person has uh, somebody to help uh, him with certain tasks then it would be you know a good thing that okay the patient wants to do this and currently we are not able to do it or there are some limitation so he has something some somebody to offer him help so again these things are uh, major if you consider here yeah, this plays a major role in like final prescription part yeah yeah it will give you an overview was final prescription and as i said it's a very lengthy process correct and you were saying like basic information we have to go into the history also then yeah. we have to ask the goals you know like what the patient needs you know what is it that they have in their mind sometimes the patient doesn't want a functional thing yeah, they just want the, something cosmetic thing right and if you have you know let's say assess the patient for emg signals and then you ask the patient what is it that you are looking for and then they tell you silly what everything would be wasted correct right correct. so i think uh, in your prescription uh, you can ask the patient what they are looking for and you know assess the patient accordingly so medical history goals and then you assess the patient psychologically socially 
physically you check the stump and all and then you formulate your prescription okay um while prescribing right i am sure that you will have some limitations or so specific to your upper limb cases or what cases you have seen what limitation do you follow for like there is a general limitation or like a specific to patient to patient specific like um, uh, i had this um, congenital patient de below elbow right and we have uh, done you know a lot of uh, congenital patient but finding the signals you know never became an issue for us okay. but with that particular patient i spent um, nearly 30 minutes right just to find signals just to find signals because okay. it was damn crazy like we were not able to we tried i think every place on her stump i were, we were still not able to get that kind of you know uh, isolated signal right so do a software allow uh, allows us to do minor adjustments and so it was a plus point but still as a prospective i was looking that okay let's just find it uh, find a good sign then we can do the adjustment and you know uh, amplify that thing right so it's not generally a case with the congenital patient but with that particular patient it was an issue so limitations are very again subjective and can vary from person to person right sometimes it, it can be uh, you know a medical condition and i like i'm dealing with this uh, uh, patient currently who has a severe uh, residual limb pain okay and with that kind of pain fitting up a stress is is a nightmare yeah is a nightmare so we are currently working with this uh, you know physician to find out the root cause yeah. and treat it first and then proceed with the fitting correct yeah and then you may or may not find this uh, things in one you know every patient but that could be a thing and other things i guess apart from medical of course um, limitation on like challenges could be there like patient as i was uh, you know we were discussing earlier can present you with unique uh, uh, requirements and, yeah. and uh, so you have to consider everything sometimes uh, you struggle with training i i mean i have covered every part of uh, <laughs> the patient journey here yeah. yeah, the patient uh, has a medical condition that i have to you know solve first and then proceed with it right sometimes there are some unique uh, expectations other times uh, the training part become uh, challenging so every patient is unique every patient comes with its own uh, task set of challenges i guess yes yeah. yes, yes and you have to see what is it and then you have to proceed and yes but there is one advice that i would really like to give no. if there is a medical condition presented in front of you i would really advise to solve that first and then uh, you know proceed with the fitments because you had this patient above elbow and he has a lot of uh, distal soft tissues my advice was that let's do the bandaging you know and uh, some therapies and if needed maybe we can do reconstructive surgeries right and let's solve this issue first and then proceed with the fitment but he insisted that he wants to get the fitment there only yeah. and i couldn't say no i felt yeah. he gave me some very reasonable explanations so i said okay so i had to proceed with whatever condition was presented in front of me and i remember during our first socket trial uh, due to the soft tissues the socket got stuck so we were not able to take it out and uh, eventually we had to cut it i mean so it you know took uh, a bit of head and trial to get the right socket fit so like imagine the scenario if uh, we would have I that i know that scenario like um, i was in my internship and uh, one patient came for lower limb mm-hmm. and uh, she was having like um, a amputation just below the, like it was a long stump okay but the problem was her calf muscles were like so it has so much of volume fluctuation that we recommended her uh, that you control the volume first because uh, she was a diabetic 
so in diabetic uh, volume fluctuation is the most common one so we recommended her to give some therapy bandages so that the volume can be controlled she insisted no 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 i just want to do this one and as she came walked into the clinic we were like okay we can do it but you will face these challenges and exactly that thing happened we fabricated the whole socket the first try when she came for trial the first trial what happened was the socket was not going in hmm. then okay we said no problem we made another socket the same day like uh, maybe 2 hours apart and then the socket was too loose and to us the volume fluctuation was that much and that patient was like i want a prosthesis and i'm like ma'am please understand first you control yes. this and <laughs> see socks will work like one two layer sock yeah of course but for her case if we went with socks the whole suspension of the socket will go out yeah so you were using silicon yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, then also the so much of volume fluctuation in the end like after very much trial and error uh, wastage of at least four five sockets then finally the time came that the volume was like constant for two weeks then the socket was made it was a headache for that time yeah i could totally understand see these things can impact the outcome yeah uh is there anything you would like to share like your achievements or uh, the experiences uh achievements uh i think every patient of mine has uh, been i don't know an achievement for me yeah. but yeah i think there are some good points or you know things uh like uh, we were talking about earlier right that uh, you are very active in knowledge sharing events yeah. like the cre and all of that please hello <laughs> yeah so like i think the those cre programs has been a very wonderful experience and you know i gained the uh, opportunity to share my knowledge with people and learn from others i remember somebody mentioning that I might be the youngest PNO who has become a resource person in that CRE program. So I don't know. I'd still need to verify. <laughs> But yeah, this is what I have heard. But regardless of that, it has been a very wonderful experience for me. And uh, apart from that, I believe um, like there there is this uh, very robust um, elbow. you know that comes with afp mechanism automated forearm balance mechanism right so uh i became the first prosthetist in the asia who has fitted that aimbo and you have fitted it in india or yes in india so um i think working with different component has been really rewarding and these kind of incidents i don't know achievement but yes has given me the confidence in my ability to start you know if you want you can do things even if others around you might not be familiar with well we have talked so much about all the upper limb and everything uh in the end i'll still have one question um in your opinion um how do you see this upper limb space um evolving in near future or maybe in future not near but in future yeah. um what is your experience or take on that i uh, see um things have evolved with time correct right due to advancement in materials design and technology and uh, you know in upper limb what i am observing is uh, uh, advancement or development is happening on both the sides like the surgical one as well as the technical one right so uh, you know significant work is going on in osteo integration or transplantation so maybe the future may take turn in that direction also right but currently what i am seeing is people are very focused on developing cutting edge technology yeah right 
so uh, we have uh, seen um the hand uh, jump you know evolving from basic my electric to these kind of bionic hands yeah. right and i read an article also where they are working to develop a kind of hand which provides individual finger control like let's say if you want to close index it will close index if you want to close little it will close little like that instead of jumping between grip hey so i think people are actually recognizing the need uh where you know um work is needed and they are putting efforts to it right so i think we have a lot of uh, scope to develop things in different aspect and you never know what the future looks like yeah. but i think we can all we can have the possibility that this is what is happening around us so maybe that could be the scenario well thank you for your insights and a great chat with me um i hope this conversation what we did is a extension of what we have talked about now and help uh, maybe of some professionals and people who might need the services great thank hope. you for being here thank you thank you so much for having me again and i had a wonderful time <laughs>